grieving widow came a little too easy for this attractive preacher's wife. Sharon Nelson married and buried husbands as calmly as some of us shop for shoes. Nelson divorced husband number one. He was the lucky one. True crime author Greg Olson has written a thrilling page turner called The Confessions of an American Black Widow. The true story of greed, lust, and a murderous wife. Please welcome Greg Olson. <laughs> now, we're just talking. You said you couldn't even make up a character like Sharon Nelson. Tell us why. Well, I'll, th the reason you couldn't make her up is she is so ridiculous, so over the top in the way she looks, the way she acted, uh, the things she did. She was uh, one of those trashy, flashy kind of gals that uh, uh, people talk about. So married, but flirted with everybody from her church pew. She Beyond wore Beyond flirting. I mean, she went as far as she could go with with just about every guy that she could get her hooks into. So you know, I look at her, I don't, I don't know. I know it, that. it's. <laughs> I don't know, but that's a prison shot there. <laughs> <laughs> so, so that could help. And that's one of the better <laughs> shots, <laughs> frankly. But what's interesting is she would wear the shortest of shorts, right. and she would lure men into her web. And and it goes back to she was married to a preacher. Right. And things were a little rocky there, but she goes to a small town with this preacher, and suddenly has her eyes on a guy who's a deacon in the church, Perry Nelson. Why was she so attracted to Perry Nelson? Well, actually, she, you know, they had they came to Colorado because they had a rough spot in their marriage back east, you know, where she had an affair and was trying to, you know, he was trying to hold it together, the preacher was. But Sharon wanted to have fun. She wanted to kick up her heels, so she, and she wanted money. Of course, the preacher didn't have much money. He was a Seventh-day Adventist, young guy, um, just starting out with a small congregation, and she ended up looking through the church records to find out who was the wealthiest guy in the church. Mm. And that's, that's who she went after. That's how she targeted Perry Nelson. Yeah. And he was married with a family? Yeah, he was a family guy. He was a, a very nice man, uh, well-respected in his community, but he was an easy victim for someone like Sharon. So what did she do, I mean, with Perry, for example, to use, use him? I mean, how did she snare him? Uh, well, really, she, it was with sex. I mean, that's how she snared all these guys, these hapless guys that maybe weren't so happy in their marriages. You know, maybe they were, you know, looking for a little adventure in their small town life, and she uh, kind of sashayed into town and showed them a new thing. So she gets the successful optometrist in Perry Nelson, and she's hanging out with them, and she even takes camping trips with the family with together. With the family, as she's plotting her way to get this man away from his wife. Perry Nelson's daughter, Lori, is on the telephone with us, and, and Lori, I really appreciate you being here and, and going through this with us again because I know this has been very painful for you and your family. You were you were actually babysitting when you first met Sharon Nelson. What, what were your, some of your first thoughts about her when you saw her? <clears throat> well, I immediately liked Sharon. Um, I liked her daughters and I thought she was a very fun, outgoing person and she was very good at um, communicating with someone my age. I mean, she was very charming with people of all ages and so I, I have to say I liked her very much. She tried to get close with you, didn't she? But it turned around she was actually getting in a lot of trouble. Yes. Um, of course, after she married my father, I lived with them on and off. I was back and forth between living with them and living with my mother and very much thought that she was trying to be my buddy. But as time went by and, and different things happened and different pieces of information came to my attention. Well, Lori, let's get specific with this because she was okay. saying things like, okay, you can drink mm -hmm. at home and, and have alcohol even though you weren't supposed to really be having alcohol. And then what would she do once she gave you the alcohol? Well, I, I attended a boarding academy where alcohol was not allowed and she actually bought some for me and helped me disguise it. She bought some peppermint schnapps and put it in a scope bottle. And as, as a teenager, that's pr pretty cool, actually. I thought it was very cool. Yeah. You know, I was uh, going through the typical rebellious mm -hmm. stage. Right. And, um, and I think it hits kids of divorced parents more than it does anybody else. So she buys you the alcohol, but then how does she turn around and use the alcohol against you? Well, years later, um, after um, I was no longer in high school, I ran into my girl, Dean, and she told me that she had always felt sorry for me, and I asked her why, and she said, because your stepmother was constantly calling me and telling me that she had reason to believe you were smuggling alcohol to school and that, that I should search your room. So she was setting you up? She was setting me up. How else did she get between you and your father? Well, she 
was was nothing that was really obvious to me until um, I, I the troubles at school escalated, and I moved back to Washington, and and the the notes that I wrote to my father apologizing for the trouble that I'd gotten into. Mm-hmm. She responded to those letters, telling me that I had no right to tell him that I was sorry. And so your dad may not have even seen the mail. I, I, I doubt very much that he even got the letter of you mine apologizing. Oh. Greg, and there were some financial problems at this time, too. Sharon was spending that money she wanted. She, yeah, the minute she got that bank account, I mean, she drained it, and she sold uh, behind per- Perry's back. She was selling assets that they owned, and they were in deep financial trouble. In fact, they wanted to build. She wanted a house. She wanted out of the other woman's house, and she wanted her own house. Yeah, she, right? she, the, yeah. I mean, one lady told me, she said, you know, um, Mrs. Nelson, the first Mrs. Nelson had to wait, you know, five years to get her house, her kitchen remodeled. Mm-hmm. But We're Perry, looking at this house on the mountain. Yeah. She called it the round house. She got, but uh, Sharon got her fabulous round house. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, the second she got married, practically, they started building that thing. So a lot of people didn't want to go to Perry Nelson a, as an optometrist anymore because he'd been having an affair with the preacher's wife. And so that's what drove some of the business right. away. But then when Sharon got in there and started taking over his business, she would do some strange things to make money off of his patients as well, wouldn't she? Well, she was very abusive, actually, to her, to the patients. I mean, she would just, you know, if you didn't cooperate with her during an eyeglass fitting or something, she'd practically slap you and you know run to the back room and say I can't stand these people here you know she was just a bit histrionic a bit you know uh, like I, I want to say outrageous in her in her, the way she acted around people but she was also selling um, you know when people would come in and buy lenses Sharon would take the money and then uh, not pay the lens manufacturer and she was also beginning to have an affair with uh, another man while she was married to Perry Nelson. And we will talk more about that relationship in a m- moment. But also up next, the marriage ends in murder. Or does it? After this break, Sharon's deadly plot unfolds. But does the killer really succeed? Her mind is always playing games. She can't help counting words when people talk or always fearing her food is poisoned. Find out Wednesday how one woman's worries are ruining her life. Of looking upon the face of Dr. Perry Nelson himself. That's right, that's Perry Nelson. Just a minute, see if we can zoom in on Perry. Oh yes, there he is in all his splendor. Isn't that something? That's some home video of Perry Nelson and friends and Sharon Nelson, his wife, on a camping trip. And Sharon Nelson had been married to a minister before, is now married to Perry, basically marrying him for the money in this case. But she's having flings on the side here as well. Yeah, well, she's having like more than one fling. She has probably uh, three or four going at once. But a very close relationship with a man named Gary Adams, right. who is almost as manipulative, if not more so, than her. Oh, I don't know if he was so manipulative. I feel like he was duped in this whole thing by really? Sharon. I feel like she led him around. And oh. he was right, he lived right near he their lived current at the, house, their right. new house. He lived at the bottom of the hill. They lived on this mountain ridge and he was kind of a, a mountain man survivalist type, what Sharon thought was really, really great. She and a relationship was, that you say was based on sex. Solely on sex. There was nothing else going there. In fact, there, it really wasn't going too well there either. In the <laughs> beginning, I mean, he could have used a double dose of Viagra or something, <laughs> but he kept at it. He kept trying. And, and let's go back to Lori Nelson, because Lori, while this is all going on, you become estranged with your father. You finally get back together with him, and it's just in time for your wedding. Is that the last time you saw your dad? Lori, are you on the phone with us? Yes, I am. Can you hear me? Yes, and now I can hear you. Yes. Okay. So the last time you f- saw your father, was that at your wedding? Yes, it was. He came out to my wedding in 1982, and uh, we reconciled at that point, and we stayed in contact, uh, regular contact, between that time and July of 1983 when he disappeared. So were you pretty feeling pretty good about it? Because you thought he was getting a divorce from Sharon at this point, didn't you? Yes. When he was at my wedding, the divorce was in process, and as far as I knew, was going to be finalized very shortly. So when you found out that they had reconciled after your wedding, what were your thoughts? Well, I was dismayed. Um, I was, he had told me some of the things that she had done. Specifically at that time, she was pregnant with another man's baby, and I didn't 
feel that it would certainly be in his best interest to get back together with her, but he told me that he loved her, and I honestly believe that, that he did love her. And he, I think he was sorry that his marriage with my mother split up, and he didn't want that to happen again. He was going to do whatever it took to not lose another family, so to speak, another wife and, and two more children that they had together. So Greg Perry and, and Sharon reconcile to a degree, but how does this end up in a situation where they're talking Gary, the man she's having an affair with, and Sharon talk about murdering him? I, I really, from the minute they reconciled, Sharon was, you know, looking into insurance policies and, and making plans for her future that did not include Dr. Nelson. So the reconciliation the was reconcil just was a, I believe, was a total sham, a way to, you know, keep him around where he would be useful for her. So they decide, Gary and Sharon, that they're going to murder Perry. And he yeah. tries once, but it doesn't work, right? Yeah, he tries uh, one time, uh, you know, taking uh, the doctor out for, for drinks and getting him drunk with some knockout drops, but that didn't work, you know. And they even tried a couple of other times to kill him. Each time some excuse came where it really didn't work out. So, you know, eventually when he did disappear, there would be question about really what happened. So how did eventually they move forward? What was the plan? Well, the plan was that uh, Gary would hitch a ride to Denver with uh, Dr. Nelson mm -hmm. and uh, under the pretense of, you know, he had to go, said, I have to pull over, I've got to go to the bathroom, and he pulls over by this creek, and then he comes, Gary comes back and says, I lost my wallet, come and help me, and Dr. Nelson came over to help him, and he bludgeoned him with a rock. Donna Goodhead is on the phone with us, and Donna, you and your husband were very good friends with Perry Nelson and even hung out with him and, and Sharon. And, and you, I understand, were with Sharon the night her husband disappeared. Is that correct? That's correct. We had gone to the Mountain States Congress. Perry had gone up for a pharmaceutical meeting, and we were to meet him in his home outside of Weston. And we drove on up with a, a set of friends from Oklahoma City, and we were going to go skiing, but Bob was going to go to his optometric meetings first, and they were with us, and she kept talking about, well, Bob Perry is really looking forward to you coming because um, we talked about it before he left last night, and she just kept getting more nervous and more nervous as the time went on. And so the time goes on and on, and is, does she say anything like she's worried about him, or what is she... Is she behaving well, she strangely? Well, she remark about she had no way to call to find out if he was still in Denver. And so Bob said, well, let me give you my telephone credit card. And he took her down to the telephone in Weston outside the general store. And they used the credit card. And she said why she was calling and all of that. But she already knew that he was dead because evidently she and, and Gary had planned to kill him the night before. Did she say anything inappropriate to you about the night before anything at that time to make you suspicious? Yes. She said, oh, we've had the best sex we've ever had. Wait, wait, she told you that? Yes. Sharon was very, very uh, bold about nudity and sex. And she and Gary had made some pictures when she was pregnant with Chip. And she had these pictures hanging in the bedroom on the wall. And she said, aren't they just beautiful? She was totally in the nude. And it was a picture resembling one that Demi Moore had made on her magazine. But mm -hmm. this was before hers. And so a little bit odd behavior to be talking about your sex life when you're not sure where your husband is or if he's right. coming and all home. Of a sudden, it, she wanted to start drinking, and she went to the liquor cabinet, and she said, well, you know, if anything happened to Perry, she said, we'd have to call Nestor the arrestor. And, of course, Brooke picked up on that because that was, they rhymed his name. Evidently, he was the deputy sheriff or something. But as the evening wore on, she just kept getting more and more far out. And Greg, part of it was she was worried that the Perry wasn't dead. Well, she yeah, well she would claim that later. She didn't know what had really happened. But I mean, as Donna is sitting there, you know, she, Sharon is saying to Donna, you know, what would you do if your husband never came home? You know, how would you get by? And you know, Perry was all they really knew at that point. He was late. Mm -hmm. He was significantly late. But there was no reason to believe he was never coming home. Yeah. But Sharon was just kept hammering away. But at the same time, you, you say Sharon was a little nervous that Gary didn't actually commit the murder, that he may have hit him on the head and then he goes down the stream and he could have been alive. So right. that was really bothering her because he had for screwed quite up a while. Before. We're going to pause for a moment and up next, Sharon's strange behavior while the search for her husband gets underway. And the Black Widow pushes her luck with another marriage. Will there be another murder next? Under three different names, she married three different men, all wealthy men. 
What are you trying to do? Paul, she killed all of them. She poisoned them. Now she's left town. And that's when she mates and kills. That was the famous tagline for this thriller, The Black Widow, starring Deborah Winger and Teresa Russell, who played the Black Widow, an incredible movie. And, and we're talking about Sharon Nelson today. And Sharon is a black widow of sorts as well. And Sharon's daughter, Rochelle, was saying that Sharon would be so obsessed and intrigued by that movie, The Black Widow, that nobody could interrupt her. She just was absorbed. She watched it over and over like it was her greatest hit. <laughs> you know, I don't know. And then she played it out because that's what we're hearing about today. Sharon, um, her husband, Perry Nelson, was missing for some 13 months. But during that time, she did some really bizarre things, and not like a widow who might be grieving or not knowing what's happening with her husband. What did she do while Perry was missing? I'll tell you, the most shocking thing that she did was within a week, really, within a week of his disappearance, not death, his disappearance, uh, she had Gary move in with her. I mean, in this little town where all these people were kind of like thinking, you know, what's going up there? But uh, she also started selling his, his guns, his anything that she could move, she sold. She had the wedding ring melted, didn't she? She had, a, yeah, she had the wedding ring made into a little pendant for uh, Gary to wear. So and her husband's missing and his wedding ring made into a pendant for the new boyfriend. Right, for the new boyfriend. And she's telling people about it, you know, look what I had made. Unbelievable. Uh, Dr. Terry Mitchell is on the phone with us as well. And uh, Terry, you went on a search near the river where the body of Perry Nelson might have been found. What, what happened on that search? How was Sharon behaving? Uh, well, we, uh, myself and some members of the family went up to uh, Golden to search the river below where the car went into the river because the uh, police and the fire department hadn't really conducted the search. And uh, so we suggested to Sharon that we all go up there. Because that is something I want to point out it, that was sort of interesting is there's this car that goes over the edge and it goes into the river and it's just crushed and you'd think there's no way a body could s survive this, but then there's no body inside the car. Right. A and so then what was Sharon doing during this time? Uh, we all went up to uh, Golden and we went in my van. Uh, we took Sharon along with us. Uh, she wasn't, she really didn't show any emotion and while we were walking the river below where the car went into the river, uh, Sharon, most of the time, just sat in the car and watched. She never really showed too much interest in the, in the search. Terry, were you suspicious of her at this time? Uh, I wouldn't say we were suspicious. Uh, I, at the time, thought there was uh, possibly this had been orchestrated, you know, by maybe Sharon and Perry both. Mm. Uh, but she just didn't uh, seem too interested to be looking for anybody in that river. Was she hitting on you during this search? No. No, she wasn't. So she wasn't was flirting man. with you. Yeah. No, I, but I'm it happened to another, but it happened yeah, to another guy on the on the first search. Uh, when they went up in the van, Sharon was sitting next to this guy, and you know he she kept putting her hands in his lap. You know, and so they're he searching kept pushing her. her away, and he thought, you know, wow, this <laughs> we're out here searching for her dead husband, and here she is. So they finally end up finding Perry. How yeah. long it had it been? Thirteen months. Right, over a year. And then immediately he's cremated. It was just yeah. Sharon uh, identified him and had him had his remains cremated the, the next day. Uh, Dr. Mitchell wanted to go see the body himself. And because there were some so. suspicious things about the body, right, Dr. Mitchell? Oh, it, it, we've let him go on the phone, but there were some strange things. This is 13 the, months later, and there are still socks on the body right, the in this was, raging river. The, yes, I mean they they describe it like a, it would be like putting something through a. a a cement mixer or a, a, a tremendous abrasion in one of these, you know, raging rivers. His clothes, clothing was fairly well intact. His body was in pretty good shape for 13 months. We can't really explain that because he, he was cremated so quickly, and a lot of people had suspicions about when he actually died. Eventually, they hook Sharon. Sharon hooks herself to the murder. And and Lori, I want to go back to you. What were your feelings when you found out it was your stepmother who was involved in, in the death of your father? Uh complete and total anger and shock. Um, I, I, despite the fact that was not in contact with this woman anymore, no longer had tremendously kind thoughts to her, could not believe that she would be capable of, of killing my father, of killing her own children's father. And you had a chance to meet her face to face. Did yes. she ever apologize to you? No, she's never apologized to me or to my grandparents or to any other member of our family. What was that like, going to prison and seeing her? It 
was very hard, but it was something that I absolutely had to do. Um, I had to ask her why, and I had to tell her that I hated her. And I felt like once I told her that I hated her, I could let it go. And um, she she didn't have any answers for me. She completely, um, you know, tried to explain away circumstances. Um, she said she couldn't possibly begin, begin to explain um, how things were between them, how she was feeling, um, how much my father had hurt her. So she's trying to justify right. the murder. Right. Still feel anger toward her? No. I, all that's left is sadness. There's just a little part of my heart that is sad because he's not still here. You know, my, my children would have loved to have gotten to know him. Oh, Lori, so sorry for what you've been through and, and appreciate you taking time to talk with us. And uh, We need to take a commercial break, right. but what's so amazing is there's another marriage. Yep, another marriage and another murder. But who confesses to the crime when we come back? Parents sometimes do the strangest things. Has your mom or dad done something that you just can't believe? Something so shocking and out of character it caught everybody off guard? If so, call us at 206-421-LIVE immediately following today's show. Or email us at nwa at comotv4.com. Look at that. There's Sharon on TV. Isn't she, isn't she good looking? Me on TV, it's too late, Sharon. Oh, I know. Video of Sharon Nelson, who murdered her first husband, moved in with the guy who did the murdering, uh, did the killing for her, and then eventually they split up, and she ends up getting married again. How does she meet the next guy? Oh, well, the, she advertises. You know, she <laughs> runs an ad in a little, uh, you know, personal ad, and Glenn Harrelson, the uh, Denver fireman whose marriage had fallen apart, answers the ad, and uh, meets the woman of his dreams. But she's not still completely broken up with the man, Gary, who had done the killing of her Never. first husband. I mean, they were, remember, she's a gal that juggled probably five or six boyfriends or whatever you want to call them at a time. So she, Gary was always one of those important ones in that list. You know, he would, ro she would rotate him in and out. And um, Glenn uh, was never her one and only. There's no way. So who masterminded this murder of Glenn Harrelson? I, I, well, sh I'm sure Sharon did. Um, you know, they... Uh, Sharon is the one who drew a map to Glenn's house. She's the one who uh, made a request of him uh, to prove that he had killed her. What did he want her to do? He wanted, she said, bring the wedding ring. Bring it as proof. Didn't she say this pretty early on in the marriage, too? Like, oh, we got to have another accident. Well, yeah, well, even with, you know, back to those five or six guys she juggled, even one of those she wasn't really married to, mm -hmm. but she also went to Gary and said, let's kill this guy, too. And he said, well, you're not even really married to him. What's in it for me? You know, so um, with Glenn, she waited probably, uh, I'd say she married Glenn just like she did, uh, uh, you know, to, to kill him. I mean, that was the plan. Because he was dead within six months of right. their marriage. And Detective Glenn Trainer is on the telephone, and, and you're one of the people who investigated this crime. So what was so suspicious right from the get-go on this, Detective? Well, uh, when uh, Detective Elaine Tigert and I went down to make death notification, uh, it just, the emotions that Sharon displayed just weren't exactly uh, typical with what you typically see when when you make a death notification to somebody, and then uh, we started asking her questions, that sort of thing. And what was she doing that was so strange to you? Well, she just, uh, you know, she was dabbing her eyes a little bit, but uh, you know, it was just she wasn't all broken up like I would be if I found out that my wife was killed. Uh, you know, she just showed very little emotion. And uh, in talking about with her, uh, you know, we asked her questions like, you know, where were you when? Uh, when Glenn Harrelson was killed, and uh, she just immediately gave an answer to where she was, and and we found that to be very strange because we did not even know how long Glenn Harrelson be dead, had been dead yet. But she already had an alibi. It, and we should mention it was a fire. He killed a, a Gary did it, and then then cr created a fire to cover up for the crime. Right, right. right. What, what's interesting though about the uh, the night of, the night of his death, of Glenn's death, she was down the down the mountain at a friend's house watching a uh, Pippi Longstocking the movie and. She told this woman, you know, uh, Glenn and I had the best sex we ever had last night. The same line that she had used um, with Dr. Nelson. So maybe she gets excited about uh, these murders. Be. I don't you know. Don't, you don't know. D Detective, uh, you talk to Sharon and you confront her. 
and she does something rather unusual. She says, let's go meet at the Pizza Hut. Yeah, that's basically correct. We interviewed her the next day again at the uh, Trinidad Police Department and uh, basically confronted her, and, and she broke down and, and said that she wasn't willing to talk to us there at the police department. And, uh, you know, we had some concerns about whether she was afraid for her safety or not, so uh, we basically asked her where she wanted to go, and she said she didn't care. So we loaded her and her kids into the car and uh, started driving north on Interstate 25 and got about 40 miles away, and she said this would be a fine place. So we went to the Pizza Hut, and uh, she ordered her kids a pizza, and we sat down in the next booth, advised her of her rights, and uh, she confessed to uh, taking part in two murders. Did she say why she did it? Well, uh, she gave various different answers, but uh, the first one she did, she said that uh, she uh, did for love, and the second one she did for money. Um, my understanding is Gary later corrected that and said he did the first one for money and the second one for love. So, uh, you know, there's various stories about how that goes, but, mm -hmm. but uh, very, very interesting. And she gave you evidence, in fact, that they would have, she led you right to where all the, all the evidence was. That's correct. In fact, she... Uh, um, told us where we could find a map that she had drawn and given to uh, Gary Adams uh, where uh, Glenn Harrelson's house was and then told us where we'd be able to find Glenn Harrelson's wedding ring. And there's the crime scene, the home video of that as well. And I understand that she's in prison now and, and Gary are yep. in prison too, Greg? Right. Both of them are serving two life sentences in Colorado. Um, not expected to, to get out till they're in their 80s if they do live that long. Amazing story. What's your next? What's your next story? I mean, oh, um, this this one had to be just absolutely bizarre. How can I bizarre. top this one? Right? Yeah. How do you top I'll bet, this one? I bet you do. How about Mary Kay Letourneau? Really? Yes. Whoa. I'm working on that one now. It's a very difficult one. Um, Will she talk to you? Has she granted she want, you an interview? Because she's saying she only wants to. She do wants money. Oprah and money. Right. Yeah. She wants money. So if anyone's out there, contact me if you know anything. <laughs> oh, well, come great. back because we want to hear all about oh, this yes. one for sure. Oh, Thank yeah. you very much. Thank we'll you. be right back. Thank Hang you. on. <laughs> The Confessions of an American Black Widow by Greg Olson is available at bookstores everywhere.